Okay, so today we've got uh, uh, day four. We're looking at the cardiovascular system. So again, just kind of recapping. So you guys are sort of like looking at our class as a whole. So you understand kind of the journey we've been on, right? We started by introducing some metabolism concepts in general, right? Uh, and then we started moving into, it's like, all right, well, we've got metabolism. We've got to talk about how we catabolically break stuff down in order to be able to anabolically build stuff up. So we went to the digestive system, got into that catabolic stuff, uh, went into the respiratory system, which sort of speeds up all that catabolic stuff. And now we're kind of pivoting just a little bit into the cardiovascular system, which works very intimately with our respiratory system, right? Like Here's the thing, your cardiovascular system doesn't metabolize uh, or produce energy or anything like that, but it is one of the systems that relies on that energy production like massively. And it's responsible for powering the rest of the body by delivering all of those nutrients we've been talking about for the last two days. So when we looked at like all the oxygen we gathered, you know, it gets into our bloodstream. How do we get it around? You know, if we, if we get it into our lungs, how do we get it to our feet? <laughs> yeah, how do I get it to my glutes? I'm doing some squats later today. You know, like, how do we do all that, right? That's where your cardiovascular system comes in. So uh, learning objectives today, we want to talk about what constitutes your cardiovascular system uh, and how it actually functions. So we are going to kind of look at some of the anatomy today. Some of you guys have been through this with me before. Um and you'll remember the hardest part of studying the cardiovascular system is just remembering your directions, you know, uh, like if it's going towards the heart or if it's going away from the heart. And if we can do that, you're going to be in a great spot. Um, what factors kind of give uh, rise to cardiac output? We want to understand that. We do want to understand like, you know, how our heart actually functions. Um, you know, that is, is, you know, where we're going to kind of look at uh, how we can actually improve that over time and why exercise is just so gosh darn good for us. Um, then we'll sort of tie everything together to what we talked about yesterday with like our VO2 max, um, talking about like not only like oxygen extraction from like breathing and stuff, but oxygen delivery from, you know, that cardiovascular system and stuff. Uh, we want to get into the different divisions of our nervous system and how that controls our cardiovascular system as well. So how your nervous system is either speeding up your heart rate or slowing it down uh, and how your arteries are going to sort of operate throughout um, that entire uh, uh, situation, right? Like when they're expanding to either deliver blood to an area or constricting to ensure that blood delivery goes somewhere else. So your cardiovascular system does a lot of stuff stuff, right? It regulates your body temperature. That's actually one of the reasons why, um, here's kind of a weird fun fact for you guys. Next time you're in like a very cold scenario and you just keep noticing that like your fingers get really cold, you know, sometimes people will like, they'll go to like the bathroom, like they'll run their fingers on their, under like a hot tap or they'll like, you know, they'll, they'll put their fingers up to like a heater just temporarily. Uh, that will actually somewhat overall make you colder, <laughs> uh, in general. <laughs> um, it, what's really interesting is why, like, it feels like your hands never heat, like you'll heat them up and you're like, that's great. And then like 30 seconds later, they're freezing again. Um, and the reason for that is because like one of the ways your body regulates body temperature is it brings your blood vessels to the surface of your skin when it is trying to like lose heat, right? So like, um, uh, or I'm sorry, when it wants to, uh, I'm sorry, gather heat, right? So it'll actually move to like the surface of your skin if there's like a hot air. So your blood vessels will expand. When you're cold, your blood vessels actually constrict and move further away so that that cold ambient temperature doesn't get into your blood. But what'll happen is like when you heat your hands up temporarily, uh, it expands all the blood vessels. Then you pull them back into the cold air, which brings all that coldness back in. And that's why it's kind of a vicious cycle. Um, trick to that, by the way, is actually to use your hands, <laughs> uh, and pump them as much as you can, uh, that will actually expand those blood vessels, uh, a little bit more effectively. And then if you can get the rest of your body metabolizing, that'll heat you back up. So you being on the whole, much more active, um, you know, walking somewhere, being active, even take just a second to do a few squats, <laughs> uh, that can actually really help a lot more than, simply trying to warm up the hands a little bit. Uh, it also removes excess heat through like sweat and things like that. So like, for instance, if it moves all the blood vessels to the surface and at the same time begins sweating, what'll happen is cold air 
will rush across uh, uh, the sweat on your skin, and that will evaporate that water, carrying the heat away from your body. So regulating temperature is a big part of our cardiovascular system, weirdly enough, uh, but it's also the more important part that we're talking about today, distributing oxygen and nutrients to the various different parts of the body, right? So when we talk about the cardiovascular system, we wanna make sure that we know what pieces we are talking about. Your cardiovascular system as a whole is going to be your heart, that's powering the entire thing, your blood, and all of your blood vessels. So those three things together are what make up that overall system, right? So it's the heart, blood and blood vessels. And it's responsible for delivering, providing a delivery system of nutrients throughout the body, right? Um, so we're gonna get into the heart's anatomy, but again, this stuff is sometimes a little hard to keep straight just because uh, it's all about like directions, you know? Like anybody who's lived here in LA, uh, I don't know if you're like me, but like I have a really, I live in the Valley and have for over a decade at this point. And I still have a really hard time knowing which way is east and which way is west and which way is north and which way is south, unless I'm like actually looking out like my window. <laughs> and the reason, the what's that, Kelvin? I have the same issue. Right? <laughs> still <Here's>... don't know. <laughs> well, yeah. Here's why it's so difficult, right? Because in my brain, I'm like, all right, well, the 101's going this way, and I know the 101 freeway runs north to south but in the freaking valley it's running east to west you know like, and so it's like really confusing and i get i still get lost like on that in my head every single time um and it's 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 because of just like the little you know the little kink that it has in it right and there's nothing more frustrating than like if you go to like laurel canyon you can look and it'll say it'll have a sign that says 101 north and then you look down below it and the other sign says 101 east <laughs> and it's like that is not or no 101 west would be north and i'm like wow that is not cool <laughs> so that is sometimes what it feels like to study your heart uh because a lot of times we're talking about like arteries and here's the rule guys arteries always go away from the heart and veins always go towards the heart. And in most of your arteries, like 90% of them, uh, if it's traveling through an artery, it's oxygenated blood. And if it's traveling through a vein, it's deoxygenated blood. But that switches when it's traveling to the lungs. And that's always very confusing. So in order to make that a little bit clear, we want to make sure we have some visual images in our head. You guys know what we're going to do. We're going to get our crash course on. So crash course cardiovascular, that should be enough. All right. Presenting Home Chef Oven Ready Meals. There is easy We're actually doing three. a ton of videos today. Step one, combine the pre opt Your heart, that throbbing, beating muscle, is probably the most iconic organ in your body. No other organ gets its own holiday or as much radio play. And you're unlikely to get a love note decorated with a kidney or a spleen or even a brain, which is really what rules the emotions. Don't get me wrong, the heart does some great things. Namely, it powers the entire circulatory system, transporting nutrients, oxygen, waste, heat, hormones, and immune cells throughout the body over and over. But in the end, the heart does not make you love. It doesn't break apart if you get dumped by your boo. And it's not a lonely hunter. The truth is, the heart is really just a pump. A big, wet, muscly brute of a pump. And it doesn't care about poetry or chocolate or why you're crying. The heart has only one concern. Maintaining pressure. If you've ever squeezed the trigger on a squirt gun or opened a can of shaken soda, you've seen how fluids flow from areas of high pressure, like inside the gun or the can, to areas of low pressure, like outside. The heart's entire purpose is to maintain that same kind of pressure gradient by generating high hydrostatic pressure to pump blood out of the heart while also creating low pressure to bring it back in. That gradient of force is what we mean when we talk about blood pressure. It's basically a measure of the amount of strain your arteries feel as your heart moves your blood around more than five liters of it at about 60 beats per minute. That's about 100,000 beats a day, 35 million a year, two to three billion heartbeats in a lifetime, the basic physiology of which you can easily feel just by taking your own pulse. I don't have a watch. Now that might not inspire so much poetry, but it turns out it's still a pretty good story.
Let us begin with a little anatomy. Unless you happen to be of the Grinch persuasion, the average adult human heart is about the size of two fists clasped together. One of the few bits of trivia you often hear about human anatomy that is actually true. The heart is hollow, vaguely cone-shaped, and weighs only about 250 to 350 grams, a pretty modest size for your body's greatest workhorse. And although Americans tend to put their right hand over their left breast while pledging allegiance, the heart is actually situated pretty much in the center of your chest, snuggled in the mediastinum cavity between your lungs. It sits at an angle, though, with one end pointing inferiorly toward the left hip and the other toward the right shoulder, so most of its mass rests just a little bit left of the mid-sternal line. The heart is nestled in a double-walled sac called the pericardium. The tough outer layer, or fibrous pericardium, is made of dense connective tissue and helps protect the heart while anchoring it to some of the surrounding structures so it doesn't let it bounce all over the place while it's beating. Meanwhile, the inner serous pericardium consists of an inner visceral layer, or epicardium, which is actually part of the heart wall, and an outer parietal layer. These two layers are separated by a thick film of fluid that acts like a natural lubricant, providing a slippery environment for the heart to move around in so it doesn't create friction as it beats. The wall of the heart itself is made of yet more layers, three of them. That epicardium on the outside, the myocardium in the middle, which is mainly composed of cardiac muscle tissue that does all the work of contracting, and the innermost endocardium, a thin white layer of squamous epithelial tissue. Deeper inside, the heart has a whole lot of moving pieces that I'm not going to pick apart here because the really big thing to understand is how the general system of chambers and valves and veins and arteries all work together to circulate blood around your body. Of course, fluid likes to move from areas of high pressure to areas of low pressure, and the heart creates those pressures. Form, once again following function. Your heart is divided laterally into two sides by a thin inner partition called the septum. This division creates four chambers, two superior atria, which are the low pressure areas, and two inferior ventricles that produce the high pressures. Each chamber has a corresponding valve, which acts like, like a bouncer at a club at closing time, like he'll let you out, but not back in. When a valve opens, blood flows in one direction into the next chamber, and when it closes, that's it. No blood can just flow back into the chamber it just left. So if you put your ear against someone's chest, and yeah, ask for permission first, you'll hear that lub dub. Lub dub. What you're really hearing are the person's heart valves opening and closing. It's a relatively simple but quite elegant setup, really. Functionally, those atria are the receiving chambers for the blood coming back to the heart after circulating through the body. The ventricles, meanwhile, are the discharging chambers that push the blood back out of the heart. As a result, the atria are pretty thin-walled because the blood flows back into the heart under low pressure, and all those atria have to do is push it down into the relaxed ventricles, which doesn't take a whole lot of effort. The ventricles are beastly by comparison. They're the true pumps of the heart, and they need big, strong walls to shoot blood back out of the heart with every contraction. And the whole thing is connected to the rest of your circulatory system by way of arteries and veins. We'll go into a whole lot more detail about these later, but the thing to remember first, if you don't already remember it, is that arteries carry blood away from the heart, and veins carry it back toward the heart. To differentiate the two, anatomy diagrams typically depict arteries in red, while veins are drawn in blue, which incidentally is part of what has led to the common misconception that your blood is actually blue at some point, but it isn't. It is always red. It's just a brighter red when there's oxygen in it. So let's look at how all this comes together, starting with a big burst of blood flowing out of your heart. The right ventricle pumps blood through the pulmonary semilunar valve into the pulmonary trunk, which is just a big vessel that splits to form the left and right pulmonary arteries. From there, and this is the only time in your body where deoxygenated blood goes through an artery, the blood goes straight through the pulmonary artery into the lungs where it can pick up oxygen. It finds its way into very small thin-walled capillaries, which allow materials to move in and out of the bloodstream. In the case of the lungs, oxygen moves in and carbon dioxide moves out. The blood then circles back to the heart by way of four pulmonary veins, where it keeps moving to the area of lowest pressure, because that is what fluids do. And in this case, that's the inside of the relaxed left atrium. Then the atrium contracts, which increases the pressure, so the blood passes down through the mitral valve into the left ventricle. So the thing that just happened here, where a wave of blood was pumped from the right ventricle to the lungs, and then follow the lowest pressure back to the left atrium? There's a name for that. It is the pulmonary circulation loop. It's how your blood unloads its burden of carbon dioxide into the lungs and trades it in for a batch of fresh oxygen. It's short, it's simple, at least in the way I have time to describe it, and it's just delightfully effective. Of all the substances you need to continue existing, oxygen is the most urgent, the one without which you will die in minutes instead of hours or days or weeks. But it's pretty useless unless the oxygen can actually reach your cells, and that hasn't happened yet. For that, 
and your newly oxygenated blood needs to travel through the rest of your organ systems and share the wealth. And that fantastic journey, known as the systemic loop, begins in the left ventricle when it flexes to increase pressure. Now, the blood would like to flow into the nice low-pressure left atrium where it just came from, but the mitral valve slams shut, forcing it through the aortic semilunar valve into your body's largest artery, nearly as big around as a garden hose, the aorta, which sends it to the rest of your body. And after all your various greedy muscles and neurons and organs and the heart itself have had their oxygen feast at the capillary bed buffet, that now oxygen-poor blood loops back to the heart, entering through the big superior and inferior vena cava veins straight into the right atrium. And when the right atrium contracts, the blood passes through the tricuspid valve into the relaxed right ventricle and right back to where we started. This whole double loop cycle plays out like a giant figure eight, heart to lung to heart to body to heart again, and runs off that constant high pressure, low pressure gradient exchange regulated by the heart valves. So the first lub that you hear in that lub dub is made by the mitral and tricuspid valves closing. And they do that because your ventricles contract to build up pressure and pump blood out of the heart. This high pressure caused by ventricular contraction is called systole. Now the dub sound. And just to be clear, I'm not talking about dubstep sounds. That's the aortic and pulmonary semilunar valves closing at the start of diastole. That's when the ventricles relax to receive the next volume of blood from the atria. When those valves close, the high pressure blood that's leaving the heart tries to rush back in, but runs into the valves. So you know when you get your blood pressure measured and the nurse gives you two numbers, like 120 over 80. The first number is your systolic blood pressure, essentially the peak pressure produced by the contracting ventricles that push blood out to all your tissues. The second reading is your diastolic blood pressure, which is the pressure in your arteries when the ventricles are relaxed. These two numbers give your nurse a sense of how your arteries and ventricles are doing when they're experiencing both high pressure, the systolic, and low pressure, the diastolic. So if your systolic blood pressure is too low, that could mean that, say, the volume of your blood is too low, like maybe you've lost a lot of blood or you're dehydrated. And if your diastolic is too high, that could mean that your blood pressure is high even when it's supposed to be lower. Considering how much we've talked about the importance of homeostasis, it should come as no surprise that blood pressure that's too high or too low or anything that affects your blood's ability to move oxygen around can be dangerous. Prolonged high blood pressure can damage arterial walls, mess with your circulation, and ultimately endanger your heart, your lungs, brain, kidneys, and nearly every part of you. So I guess you could say that the best way to break a heart is to mess with its pressure. But good luck trying to write a song about that. Today you learned how the heart's ventricles, atria, and valves create a pump that maintains both high and low pressure to circulate blood from the heart to the body through your arteries and bring it back to the heart through your veins. We also talked about what systolic and diastolic blood pressure are and how they're measured. Thanks to our headmaster of learning, Thomas Frank, and to all of our Patreon patrons who help make Crash Course possible for free through their monthly contributions. If you like Crash Course and you want to help us keep making these videos and also maybe want to get some cool stuff, you can check out patreon.com slash Crash Course. Crash Course is filmed in the Dr. Cheryl C. Kinney Crash Course studio. This episode was written by Kathleen Yale, edited by Blake T. Pastino, and our consultant is Dr. Brandon Jackson. It was directed by Nicholas Jenkins. The script supervisor and editor is Nicole Sweeney. Our sound designer is Michael Aranda, and the graphics team is Thought Cafe. Okay, so uh, yeah, a lot of working pieces here. Uh, again, like the hard part is knowing like which chambers do what and which vessels go in which directions. Like we just want to make sure we can get that all memorized in a way that makes a lot of sense, right? So your heart itself is this muscular blood pumping organ uh, and it's responsible, its main job is to generate pressure by contracting and maintaining that pressure by having valves that can stay closed and not ever letting blood leak in any one, one direction, right? That's actually what like we call that regurgitation actually is. It's really dangerous. You don't want your heart to be able to like leak blood back into a chamber because that lowers the overall pressure. Like he used the super soaker as kind of an example in there. I just spent the last few minutes learning about the super soaker, by the way. Uh, it was invented by mistake by an engineer at, uh, at NASA, by the way. Very cool story. But uh, <laughs> um, when you look at, uh, uh, when you look at like the way that pressure works, when you were, if you were a kid, right, if you didn't have the super soaker all the way like plugged in or screwed in, right, right, and you go to like pump all that, the pre you would hear it like squeal, right? Like some of the pressure would actually be like leaking out. Uh, and then it wouldn't, you know, the stream wouldn't come out very strong. The same thing is true of your heart. We need it to be able to like generate that pressure by contracting but it's also very important to make sure that blood's only going in the direction that we want it to go in. So 
your heart, like I said, it is this uh, uh, this really large uh, pump there, and it's made up of several different layers. Um, if you actually look at your different like heart layers here, uh, it's kind of like an onion. Uh, you'll see uh, some really interesting stuff. First, on the outside, you'll see what's called your pericardium. Uh, this, by the way, this is actually what I thought happened. I don't know. Uh, I haven't checked up on it, but the uh, the football player that got um, he had cardiac arrest on the field recently. Um, he's from Pittsburgh. I can't. Or he wasn't a Pittsburgh player. He's a Bills player. But um, uh, I haven't looked. At, I haven't looked up what happened to him. But like my guess when I when I heard about all that, it happened like while I was on the plane home. And uh, when I landed, I like you know I was checking my feed and it was like and collapsed on the field my guess it was that like he basically like she, you know he got hit in the chest his heart was able to like pump for a few seconds and he watch him like pass out and i was like i would be willing to bet that his connective tissue that holds his heart in place basically became dislodged that's actually a very common injury when you get hit in the well i say very common but it can happen when you get hit in the chest really hard um and i haven't looked up to see if i'm right yet or not but uh, but like that's that's what this outer layer actually is. I looked uh, it up. Yeah, what did what they say actually happened to him? Uh, I forget the name of the diagnosis, but it's an extremely rare condition where huh. if your heart is hit with blunt force at a specific microsecond, mm. it stops. And oh, yeah. I, I I saw a very interesting chart where it, there's a there's like a millisecond. Uh, just yeah. it, it's a one in a bazillion chance okay. that it happened it's it's actually pretty fascinating to read about so you know okay. y'all should google that after <laughs> yeah so you probably like you probably just knocked his essay now we're gonna get to yeah, that damar hamlin and he's actually awake now he's like yeah yeah, yeah he's so it was crazy but yeah well, i actually I was watching the game when it happened but it was, really? yeah, it was as crazy. long as honestly as long as his heart uh didn't get like deoxygenate for too long and didn't get any damage he should be fine uh like overall if that's the case as long as well, no it's not the vaccines no <laughs> <laughs> oh god who have you been talking to <laughs> I'm messing, I'm messing, I'm messing. um well anyway uh this connective tissue on the outside of your heart here we call this your pericardium it's kind of this fibrous sac that encloses the heart and it's there to hold it in place because, you know, your your heart's pumping constantly. There's a lot of tissue nearby. We don't exactly want our heart to get stuck to some other type of tissue and get dragged around the inside of our body, right? So this sac right here is there. Uh, and then there's a little layer. You can see somebody drew it here, actually. I'll find a little bit of a better picture there. Uh, that'll work. Uh, you can see there's actually a little bit of an empty space layer in between the pericardium and the actual first layers of the heart. And the reason for that is because we also don't want the heart itself to get stuck to the sac that it's in and then lose its ability to, to contract and stuff. So, you know, it's enclosed in that pericardium there that's kind of holding it in place. And then the big thing about your heart's overall anatomy is that it's four chambers, okay? It's four central chambers. And those four chambers are going to gather and eject blood into different places. So here's how we're going to kind of like uh, draw this out to understand it, because I am not so good at drawing. I mean, you look at a real heart, like, it's not very easy to draw, uh, <laughs> especially when you look at the chamber. So we're going to use a Valentine's heart. So we're gonna go like this. And this is gonna be our heart here, right? Um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna divide this into four sort of quadrants, because that's actually how your heart kind of divides down. Um, it works something kind of like this. You've got these four, uh, uh, you know, these four central chambers here. I messed up my, that was a perfect line. I screwed it up. <laughs> um, so it's these four central chambers, a top of the heart, a bottom, and a left, and a right, okay? So it looks something kind of like this, right? So what we're going to do is we'll go ahead and put this just a little bit lower here. So uh, this is going to be the... Uh, now, here's what's very, very confusing, and I, I say it's very confusing. It's not that bad, but I missed my teachers telling me this the first time I ever studied the heart. And I remember being literally confused for like a couple weeks um, because I just missed this understanding. When you are looking at a diagram of the heart, it is drawn and labeled 
as if you are looking at a real heart. So when we label it, we always label things from the perspective of whose heart it is. So for instance, like this is my right hand to you guys looking, it would it's on, it would be on the left side of things, right? So this is not, yeah, this is the left side of my screen. This is the right side of the heart over here, right? This is the left side of the heart over here. And that we're not going to forget that. And it's going to be a little bit confusing. This is the top and this is going to be the bottom. Cool. So now we've got our four quadrants, right? We've got the right side on top, the left side on top, the right side on bottom, and the left side on bottom. And we're going to have a chamber in each section of the heart here, right? So we're going to divide our heart's chambers, and we'll, we'll look at that here. Look at a picture here. Um, ah. So you can see here, I thought that was Excel for a second. I was like, why am I opening Excel? Uh, so you can see there's the different chambers of heart. Again, the right is on the left, the left is on the right. Again, this is the person's right side of their heart. I missed my teachers like saying that. I remember like looking at my anatomy textbooks and just being so confused for the first like literally couple weeks before I figured it out. Uh, <laughs> like that's a, there's, there's me and 18 me, 18 year old me. So these are the different like chambers that you've got here, right? Um, now we're drawing this side of the heart, this right side of the heart, we're drawing that in blue. That is to represent the deoxygenated side of the heart, meaning that all of the blood while it's in here has already delivered its oxygen and picked up CO2. And now it's ready to get over and get some new oxygen and drop off that CO2. So you never have any blue blood in your body. We covered that yesterday, right? But we are going to draw it in blue because it's a little bit easier to understand. So this right up here in this side, this is going to be your right atrium, okay? Uh, and then on the bottom, we are going to have our right ventricle, okay? Uh, so there's our right atrium. There's our right ventricle. On the left side of the heart, we're going to see the oxygenated side of things. So this is going to be our left atrium, and this one's going to be our left ventricle. Cool. So now we've got different sides of the heart and we've got two categories of chambers, right? If we've got four chambers, we've got two types of chambers. We've got atriums and we've got ventricles. The top of the heart, those are atriums. The bottom of the heart, those are ventricles. Now, what the heck is an atrium? What is a ventricle? Well, watch this. If I Google the word atrium, right? I'm just going to Google atrium and we're going to see it's a big empty chamber right that's what this is right there's an atrium there's an atrium right lots of really cool stuff you go to like a bird atrium in a zoo you know sometimes you can actually walk through them and all the birds are flying around and stuff right like it's a big gathering area and that's still true here as well these atriums are in charge of gathering blood that has returned to the heart okay so i can say my right atrium gathers whoop, I'm blue. gathers blood that has returned to the heart okay and then i can do the same thing over here we're going to say the left atrium gathers blood that has returned to the heart now that's not super helpful <laughs> right those definitions are the same so what's the deal like if that's that's not going to help us right um so here's what makes the difference between the right atrium and the left atrium, right? The right atrium has gathered blood that has returned to the heart. And where has it just been? From, from the body, right? So this is deoxygenated blood because it's come from the body, right? Well, I'm not going to have room for that. <laughs> Uh, well, we get it, right? So it gathers deoxygenated blood that has returned from the body. And our left atrium gathers oxygenated blood that has returned to the heart uh, from the lungs, right? So the left atrium is gathering the oxygenated stuff. The blood just came from the lungs. It picked up a ton of oxygen. It's highly, highly oxygenated. 
So it comes right back into that atrium. So those are our two atriums, right? They're in charge of gathering blood, both of them. One of them from the body, one of them from the lungs, right? So the next thing we gotta look at are our ventricles. Now, what is a ventricle? Well, think about the word venting, right? Uh, you're ejecting something out, right? That's what a vent does, right? So we are venting blood out of the heart. Our right ventricle, because this is deoxygenated blood, it is blood that we are going to, e so the ventricles are uh, going to eject, ejects blood out of, hold on a second, <laughs> getting this to fit. <laughs> yeah. Ejects blood out of the heart. Uh, and, you know, that's not a super helpful definition because guess what? I'm going to write the same thing over here. It ejects blood out of the heart. Okay, so again, not helpful because those definitions are the same, right? But how do we how do we sort of separate them? <clears throat> well, oh, I also spelled ejects wrong. That's okay. I'm just gonna deal with it and not go crazy. Uh, well, in the right ventricle, because it's deoxygenated, the first place we want that blood to go is it's gonna eject blood out of the heart towards. No, it's not gonna fit. Uh, towards the lungs, okay? So that's its job. It's trying to eject blood out of the heart. Oh, we're going to go like this. <laughs> to <laughs> the lungs. <laughs> <clears throat> I've never tried to do this weird version of typing before. So ejects blood out of the heart <clears throat> to the lungs. And the left ventricle is going to eject blood out of the heart. Uh, uh, to the, and then that's going to be to the body. Okay, so there we go. So now, guys, my advice to you, if you if you want to like really remember like all these different chambers here, right? Um, if you want to keep this totally clear in your heads, here's my advice for how to do that. Um, just remember in general, what the definitions are for the chambers. Atriums, it's an atrium. It gathers stuff, right? Ventricles, it's a vent. It vents stuff. And then remember this one right here. Remember your left ventricle, okay? This guy right here is the most important. This is the one we're going to really pay the most attention to, okay? So we're going to give this the award for being the most important. <laughs> okay, that's the chamber we want to pay the most attention to. And the reason why is because that's the chamber that you guys are all probably the most familiar with, right? So like your left ventricle is the chamber that's responsible for ejecting blood out to the rest of the body. So if you've ever tested your pulse, but I just did the wrong side. If you've ever tested your pulse before, um, you have felt blood being ejected out of the left ventricle, okay? Um, that's the chamber that you've actually, that's, that's actually what you're feeling. Every time your heart squeezes and the left ventricle pumps blood out, like all the blood vessels throughout your body kind of bulge for just a second. And so you can feel that if you are feeling your pulse. So your left ventricle is the pulse that you can kind of feel through your skin. That's the one I tell people to memorize. Because here's what you can do. You can kind of logic your way backwards to figure out all what all the other chambers do. You're like, okay, the left ventricle, which means that's the one that I'm feeling. It's going everywhere, which means if it's going everywhere, it's got to have oxygen in it. So if I've got a left ventricle, then I've got to have a right ventricle. My right ventricle doesn't have any oxygen in it. That means that one's pumping to the lungs. Cool. Now you know which both of your ventricles are. The other thing you got to remember, what's the opposite of a ventricle? An atrium. So then you're like, all right, left is going to be attached to left. Right's going to be attached to right. And you're going to go, all right, left atrium gathered that oxygenated blood. I just pumped the oxygenated stuff. Right atrium gathered the deoxygenated stuff. And that's a good way to kind of keep your heart memorized. I always tell people, this is the one I want you to pay attention to, the left ventricle. That's the important one. 
Uh, I mean, they're all important, you know, <laughs> but like, but that's how we're going to kind of do this here, right? So those are the la those are the chambers of the heart. Everybody feel pretty good about that before we move on. This is, in my opinion, the most confusing part of the day. Checking in with you guys. Everybody good? Good on? over here. Good over here. Yeah. How about my new folks? Yes, right. I mean, some of you guys have seen this before. Yeah, I'm good to go. All righty. All right. Well, stop me, guys. Anytime you need a question, anytime we need to clear it up. Um, I always, I always ask, and everybody, <laughs> I can't tell you uh, that story I told you earlier about me not understanding the different sides of the heart because I missed someone telling me that it was from the perspective of whoever's heart it was. That is a that is a true story, and it has led to me always being really worried that the heart is maybe a little bit more confusing than it actually is. Because I always have this moment where I'm like, "You guys good? Everybody good?" And everybody's like, "Yeah, we're fine. You're the one who had trouble." <laughs> like, like that is yeah. Anyway, all right. So stop me if you if you guys need help, but uh, but those are our different chambers. All right. So uh, <laughs> looking at the layers of the heart. Um, uh, and the heart walls itself. We do want to know a little bit about those. So if we look at our heart layers again, um, here are some word here's some word anatomy that will kind of help you guys uh, kind of remember this stuff. So you've got your pericardium, right? Uh, think about where that word comes from, the word perimeter, right? You would have a perimeter around the outside of something. So your pericardium, this empty sac around the outside, isn't even necessarily part of the heart itself. It's really much more like connective tissue that just happens to be attached to the heart. Uh, the actual heart layers itself are going to be right here. You're going to have three main layers, okay? Uh, you are going to have an outer layer that has a little bit of fat underneath it. That's called your endocardium. That helps, um, I'm sorry, that's your epicardium. That's the outer layer. I normally do this in the other order. Uh, so your epicardium is the outermost layer of the heart with some fat here. And the epicardium's job is to insulate the heart and also act as like, you know, the outside wall of something. It's kind of like the skin of your heart, right? Like it's there to separate all of the inside stuff. Uh, uh, switching to the inner layer of the heart, jumping all the way down here, you've got your endocardium. And I know it looks like it's got like these kind of weird markings on it and stuff, but it's extremely, extremely smooth. And that's really important because blood cells, their whole job is to clot whenever they get clumped together. So we don't want any of our blood cells to get stuck on that inner wall of the heart. So it's really smooth and really, really slick. That's your endocardium. So the endocardium is there acting as the inner chambers. When we talk about like these chambers here, the tissue that would be exposed to this inner chamber, this would be like endocardium tissue in all of these chambers, right? And then obviously there's all the stuff in the middle here. This is the most important layer of the heart. This is your myocardium. So myo comes from the prefix that means muscle. And it is, look at it, it's this huge muscular layer that's doing all of the pumping. So the epicardium is like the epicenter around the outside. The endocardium is the inner center. That's what endo means. And then the myocardium is the muscular layer. And that's the one that's really thick compared to all the other layers. It's responsible for doing all of the actual contracting. So those are the different layers of your heart, right? So now the next thing that we need to kind of look at is like how much blood is being ejected from the heart at any given time. And so the amount of like blood volume that you are ejecting per beat, right? So the volume of blood that every time your heart is contracting, your uh, your ventricles, every time they're squeezing, is averaging right around 130 milliliters of blood when it's at rest. You know, your heart's not contracting all that hard. You know, uh, uh, it's just kind of gently you know, uh, uh, contracting there. And then uh, when your heart is relaxing, the amount of blood that's like filling in is about 58, like 60 milliliters worth of blood there, right? So those terms there, the contraction and the relaxation of the heart, those are gonna be some terms that you guys are probably familiar with. That is gonna be called your uh, uh, systole and your diastole. Okay, so systole is the process of contracting your heart. You might be more familiar with that term if you call it your systolic blood pressure. Uh, and it's the amount of like pressure that your heart ejects into all the other blood vessels when it squeezes. 
And then your diastolic blood pressure is your diastole. That's the relaxation of the heart. So heart beating is two phases, systole and diastole, systole, diastole, right? And systole and diastole, they are in charge. That's actually what's pumping blood in. So during diastole, the relaxation, pressure in the heart's very low. It's empty, right? It just pumped everything out. And so what happens? Well, things naturally move to areas of low pressure. So the blood goes rushing into the heart and then the heart squeezes. And what would happen normally is all the blood would just backflow back where it came from. But you've got little valves in your heart that slam shut. So then all of a sudden they can't go back. So they have to go forward. So all of a sudden the pressure is really high and blood goes, all right, where can I go? I need an area of low pressure. And all of your blood vessels are open. So there's empty space there, and that's where they go. The blood ejects out of the heart, going towards your blood vessels, right? So that's how that's going to work. Now, I do want to really quickly, hold on just a second. I feel like my PowerPoint's out of, or my notes are out of order again. This is so weird. Uh, hold on, does it come back to, I checked this earlier. No, okay. Uh, I'm going to, come back to this because I want to talk about the, I want to keep talking about the heart before we get into blood vessels. Um, so the next thing we got to look at <clears throat> is looking at your, uh, uh, your heart's contraction cycle, your heart's actual signals, right? So when it comes to your heart signals, you've got what is called your sinoatrial node. Chances are, uh, Adam, that thing that you're describing where he got hit at just the right time, it is probably right in the middle of a signal created by this little node right here. And so it probably just interrupted this node's ability to tell the heart to contract. So this little node right here, your sinoatrial node, this little guy, uh, is responsible for creating your heart's rhythm. Because here's the thing, we want our heart to have a rhythm. Let's take a look at a heartbeat here. Um, This is actually kind of what your heart actually looks like when it's beating. You'll notice that it actually kind of beats like this. It's like boom, 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 boom. One, two, three, four, right? Uh, it finishes the top before it finishes the bottom, right? That is kind of an interesting thing. You would think that it would kind of just want to go all at once, but if it did, blood would kind of want to go in all directions. So this is, again, direct directing blood in the right direction as we want it, right? Top to bottom. So... This node right here, the sinoatrial node, it's not part of your heart officially, it's part of your nervous system. Or at least it's un if it is part of your heart, it's under the control of your nervous system. So this is known, and you guys will want to know this term, you will hear this term, you'll say this term. It is known as the pacemaker of the heart, okay? So the pacemaker of the heart, your sinoatrial node, is responsible for creating your heart's rhythm. And it responds to different chemicals. So every time, like, you know, uh, you experience stress, you create like a little bit of adrenaline, that adrenaline's running through your blood. As soon as that blood reaches the heart, your sinoatrial node goes, woof, we need to speed up. So then it starts beating faster. Uh, every time uh, your nervous system just simply says, hey, I need my heart to beat faster, it'll start beating faster. Every time your blood is a little bit extra acidic, uh, like if there's extra acid in your blood, you know, through exercise, right? We exercise, we create ATP from glucose, we're left with lactic acid. If that lactic acid gets into your bloodstream and goes to your heart, it tells your heart to speed faster, right? So your heart's like, woof, man, that is some acidic blood. And it speeds up. And that way, like, we can process that lactic acid by delivering oxygen and converting it into energy so we don't leave it as acid. So that's actually one of the reasons why, fun fact, it's one of the reasons why if you ever uh, do a little bit too much work too fast, you get nauseous. Uh, that's because your heart didn't have time. <laughs> uh, uh, that's because your heart didn't have time to pump enough oxygen through to convert lactic acid fast enough. So it just stayed acidic. Uh, and now it's like, you know, leaking into your, your digestive system. It makes you all feel queasy and feels like you want to throw up. Um, it's one of the reasons why warming up again, super, super freaking important. Uh, I had a guy playing, I was playing ultimate with a guy just the other, a couple weeks ago. And like, he was like, yeah, I haven't played in a couple of years. And he just went really hard. And all of us were playing, like, we weren't even keeping score yet. We were doing warm up points. And then we were like, oh, this guy. And sure enough, like at one point he just runs off the field. Just, 
<laughs> you're like, yep, that's what happens. <laughs> So uh, your sinoatrial node, the pacemaker of the heart, responds to a lot of different uh, electrochemical signals and a lot of chemical signals, right? So it is under the control of electricity and under the control of chemistry. So it responds to chemicals through the body, particularly adrenaline and lactic acid, which will speed it up. And now when it speeds up, the rest of your heart is going to speed up. So what will happen next is it's going to travel from the SA node, uh, uh, and it's going to travel down these little wires right here, right? Now, what's interesting is like some of them are going this way, and then some of them go down here, right? Uh, and what's cool about that is you'll notice like there's nothing over here at the top. These are just kind of an, uh, an overall like empty wire, but there's this other little node right here. This node is called your AV node. That's your atrioventricular node. You don't ever have to say that ever again, but right? <laughs> that's your AV node, right? So sinoatrial, that's the pacemaker. That's the most important. But this signal here this is what's weird about this node. It actually delays the signal. That's really weird when you think about it. It's like, wait, I just went through all this effort to make an electric signal to contract my heart. Why would I want to pause the signal right after I make it? Well, look at where the wires are connecting, right? See how it goes. See how it goes across the top like this first. Imagine like something traveling at the same speed here, right? There's electricity going this way and then there's electricity going down here, right? Well, it's going to hit this node pretty quickly and it's going to delay the signal for a second. And that way this top part has time to kind of finish and then it will run down to the rest of the heart there. So what that allows you to do is it allows you to finish contracting the top of the heart first and the bottom of the heart second. So that is your heart's conduction system. Uh, let's see if we can find a GIF of this so we can kind of see this in action here. So you'll notice what will happen is we will create the signal and it'll, it moves, this GIF's moving really quickly. But you can see like it actually pauses here for a second and that allows the top of the heart to finish its contraction first and then get back to refilling while the bottom of the heart is doing its contraction. And again, that's going to keep blood from backflowing, right? So you'll see it run across the top of the heart, pause here for a second, and then move on to the next section. Is that the slow one? There's a slow version of this black and white one. This is the one I usually show. Uh, come on, internet, help me out. <laughs> it I mean, you know what? This kind of works. You can see it though, right? Watch, it finishes the top first, pauses for a second, and then goes back through uh, to the bottom. Err. I could spend all day trying to Google stuff properly. <laughs> um, all right, let's get out of here. So, uh, so that is, uh, those are the, that's the conduction system of your heart, right? So all of those little fibers, the conduction system, you've got the sinoatrial node, which is the pacemaker, the atrioventricular node, which is a delayer, right? It's the node responsible for delaying the signal. Uh, and then down here, you've got all your Purkinje fibers, uh, which is little fibers that spread out to the heart. Uh, and then over here, you also have like a little bundle that'll branch out called coolest name ever it's called the bundle of hiss <laughs> which i've always thought like bundle of hiss would be a great name for like a heavy metal band <laughs> uh, like, like not as cool as uh death star sphincter from the other night yeah right <laughs> i told i told my fiance that and she rolled her eyes i thought she was gonna go blind <laughs> um yeah so that's how that's going to work. So again, let's uh, let's remember all of this is under the control of your nervous system, right? Particularly, it's under the control of what we call our sympathetic nervous system. So here's the thing: your blood flow is need it needs to be it needs to be tied to your oxygen demand throughout the body. Like I said, your heart will know when your blood is very acidic because blood's flowing through. And it's like, poof, that's really acidic. We must be doing a lot of work right now. If we're doing so much work, we need oxygen. If we need oxygen, I should pump faster, right? Like that's how your heart kind of goes through its processes. So when you're trying to match your blood flow to your oxygen demand, here's what's kind of cool about heart tissue, right? If we look, there's actually three types of muscle in the body. I mean, we're going to get to muscle anatomy later, but if we look at like types of muscle, I'm not talking about like type one versus type two here. Uh, what I'm talking about 
is skeletal muscle, which is all the stuff that you know moves our skeleton around. It's the stuff we're probably thinking of when we think of muscle. And that's this stuff. But then there's also smooth muscle, which is like your digestive organs and your uh, uh, your blood vessels. But then there's also a special type found only in the heart. That's cardiac muscle. And you'll notice, look at these fibers. These are individual little rods here. These are kind of squat, uh, uh, almost like epithelial tissue. And then these fibers are all tied together. And what's really interesting about that is your heart muscle is very unique. All of the fibers are interlocking. And uh, the reason for that is because when one fiber contracts, they kind of all contract, they all kind of pull together. And then you'll see one thing that we're seeing here, if you look really, really carefully at this uh, crossing, see these little like short lines that you kind of see running every now and then? there's a really thick one uh, right there. Those are called intercalated discs. And they are basically these like little discs that conduct electricity even faster through the heart tissue. So again, your heart is under the control of your nervous system. Your sinoatrial node is interacting. So when your nervous system gets nervous, right, it speeds up the heart. And when your nervous system is relaxing, it slows down the heart. It creates other hormones that kind of slow everything down or other neurotransmitters, I should say. So that's how your heart's actually going to kind of match all that together. So, uh, that is basically our heart in a uh, in a nutshell when it comes to, you know, uh, uh, looking at the anatomy of it. Now, next thing we got to do is we got to connect our anatomy. We got to get into our blood vessels, right? So we've got to look at like all of the tubes that are connected to our heart. So uh, I need to go back in my PowerPoint slides here. <laughs> uh, and we got to take a look at our blood vessels. So again, your cardiovascular system, heart, blood, blood vessels, right? So your blood vessels is this series of tubes. By the way, it's about 60,000 miles worth of tubes if you were to lay it end to end and just stretch them all out. That doesn't seem possible, uh, but that is how many, you know, you would have to take all of your blood vessels, including all of the microscopic capillaries and lay them end to end. Uh, about 60,000 miles worth. That is enough to circle around the earth, like I think twice. Um, so uh, here's a fun little video that's going to kind of show how these work, because this is the other part that we've got to get even, right? So uh, uh, words I am looking for, blood vessels, that's it. All right, here we go. Have you ever had a prospect tell you, can you send me an email with Ugh. more information? I have or, not. Can you no doubt about it, your heart is a champion. It electrifies itself, it maintains your blood pressure, it keeps your blood moving, and it's got like a nice shape you can put some chocolates inside of and give to people you like. But the circulatory system is much, much more than just that pump, because the heart also needs a network to actually send all that blood through, right? Cue the blood vessels. Although it's easy to think of them as a glorified plumbing system for your body, that's not a very good analogy. These aren't just passive tubes made merely to carry liquid around, like the pipes behind your walls at your home. Blood vessels are actually active, dynamic organs capable of contracting and expanding as they deliver oxygen and nutrients to cells throughout the body, carry away waste products, and do their part in maintaining that all-important blood pressure. You already know about the three major types of blood vessels. The arteries that carry blood away from the heart, the veins that bring it back, and the little capillaries that act as the transfer station between the two. But you've also got arterioles, which are like mini arteries that branch out into those capillaries, and venules, the smallest vein component that suck blood blood back out of the capillaries and merge into the larger veins that head home to the heart. And it's quite an incredible journey, really. If all your blood vessels could be strung together in a single line, they'd stretch out for 100,000 kilometers. That's like, if you, and then, carry the two. two and a half. It's like two and a half times around the earth. <laughs> and together, this extensive network forms a closed system that begins and ends at the heart. That means that all five or so liters of blood in your body are contained within it at all times, unless you're bleeding, which I hope you're not. If you prick a finger and watch a drop of blood pop up, you know that you've nicked a blood vessel, and that blood is leaking out of its closed system. Likewise, if you slam your shin against the corner of a coffee table on your way to the bathroom, and an hour later you see a big nasty bruise forming, then you know you've damaged your blood vessels again, because because bruising is internal bleeding, usually into loose connective tissue. And if you're embarrassed about that shriek that you let out when you bumped your leg and you start to blush, well, that's your blood vessels too, expanding, just to say hello. <laughs> Blood
Blood vessels are another great example of how anatomy and physiology go together like peanut butter and jelly. How they look and what they do go hand in hand. Most of your blood vessels share a similar structure consisting of three layers of tissue surrounding the open space or lumen that actually holds the blood. Anatomists call these layers tunics, and the innermost section is called the tunica intima, which should be pretty easy to remember because, you know, it's like has intimate contact with the lumen. It's like your circulatory underpants. The cool thing about this layer is that it <laughs> contains the endothelium which you may remember is made up of simple squamous epithelium tissue and is continuous with the lining of the heart. These cells form a slick surface that helps the blood move without friction. Surrounding the tunica intima is the middle layer, the tunica media, which is made of smooth muscle cells and sheets of the protein elastin. That smooth muscle tissue is regulated in part by the nerve fibers of the autonomic nervous system, which can decrease the diameter of the lumen by contracting this middle layer during vasoconstriction or expand it by relaxing during vasodilation. That right there should tell you that the tunica tunica media plays a key role in blood flow and blood pressure because the smaller the diameter of the blood vessel, the harder it is for blood to move through it. Kind of like trying to drink milk through a cocktail straw versus a soda straw. And finally, the outermost layer of your blood vessels is the tunica externa. It's like an overcoat if that coat were made mostly of loosely woven collagen fiber. Actually, if your coat happens to be made of leather, it is made of collagen. And like a coat, this outer layer is what protects and reinforces the whole blood vessel. Now, the ratio of the thicknesses of these three layers varies between blood vessels of different types, because guess what? Yes, form follows function. Let's take a look. Say you're gearing up for a big tournament of thumb wrestling, or what has been called the miniature golf of martial arts. How does blood move through your systemic circulatory loop to get from your heart to your champion right thumb flexing muscle, the flexor pollicis brevis, and back again? Well, you will remember from our lessons on the heart that blood leaves the left ventricle through the aorta, the biggest and toughest artery in your body, roughly the diameter of a garden hose. The aorta and its major branches are elastic arteries. They contain more elastin than any other blood vessel type, so they can absorb the large pressure fluctuations as blood leaves the heart. What's more, that elasticity actually dampens that pressure so that big surges don't reach the smaller vessels where they could cause damage. This is really where that whole pipe analogy falls apart. These arteries are really more like balloons. Their pressure reservoir is able to expand and recoil with every heartbeat. If they were rigid like pipes, they'd eventually leak or burst after being battered by so many waves of pressure. So that blood leaves your aorta, and since it's heading to your thumb, it travels along the elastic subclavian artery, which gives way to a series of muscular arteries, in this case the brachial artery in your upper arm, and the radial artery in the lower arm. Muscular arteries distribute blood to specific body parts, and account for most of your named arteries. They're less elastic and more muscular. These arteries invest in additional smooth muscle tissue, and proportionally have the thickest tunica media of any blood vessel. This allows them to contract or relax through vasoconstriction and vasodilation dilation, which we've talked about a lot in terms of the nervous system's stress response. These arteries keep tapering down until they turn into the nearly microscopic arterioles that feed into the smallest of your blood vessels, your tiny, extremely thin-walled capillaries, which serve as a sort of exchange or bridge between your arterial and venous systems. They may be little, but your capillaries are where the big, important exchange of materials actually happens. Capillary walls are made of just a single layer of epithelial tissue, which form only the tunic intima, so they're able to deliver oxygen and other nutrients in your blood to their cellular destinations through diffusion. The capillaries are also where those cells can dump their carbon dioxide and other waste back into the blood and send it away, through the veins to the lungs and kidneys, but we'll come back to that in a second. Unlike arteries and veins, capillaries don't operate on their own, but rather form interweaving groups called capillary beds. Besides exchanging nutrients and gases, your capillary beds also help regulate blood pressure and play a role in thermal regulation. Say you're in the room where you're, like, practicing your thumb calisthenics, which probably isn't the thing, but the room is a little chilly, so the blood feeding your dermis loses a lot of heat to that cold air. Well, smooth muscle forms tiny sphincters, yeah, you got sphincters everywhere, around the vessels yeah. that lead to each of your capillary beds. When they tighten up, they force blood to bypass some of those capillaries, which means less blood is exposed to the cold and you lose less heat. If it's really cold, the smooth muscles around your larger arterioles and muscular arteries, like that radial artery in your lower arm, will also squeeze, slowing blood flow to your whole hand, which is no way to win at thumb wrestling. But it's one reason why your fingers get all stiff and numb in the cold. They're not getting as much warm blood because your blood vessels are trying to conserve heat. Conversely, if your thumb is working really hard and producing heat from all that exertion, those capillary sphincters relax and open wide, flooding the capillary bed with blood to help disperse heat, which is part of the reason that you might get red-faced when you're hot or exercising hard. So anyway, now your thumb muscles have just feasted on a batch of oxygen and glucose served up on a fresh 
fresh bed of capillary and they're ready to take out the trash. The cells send their CO2 and other junk out to the venal end of the capillary exchange where the capillaries unite into venules and then merge into veins that head back to the heart. Remember that the pressure in these vessels has to be dropping since fluids always flow from higher to lower pressure. But since the pressure is so low in your veins, it's like one twelfth of the pressure in your arteries, there isn't much pressure gradient left to push the blood back to your heart. So veins require some extra adaptations to keep the blood moving in the right direction. That's why some of them, especially veins in the arms and legs that have to work against gravity, have venous valves that help keep the blood from flowing backward. If those valves leak or a vein experiences too much pressure, the backflow of blood can stretch and twist the vein, leaving you with varicose veins, or if this happens in another part of the body, hemorrhoids. But anyway, we've gotten pretty far from your thumb at this point. We got a loop to finish here. From the capillaries and venules in your thumb, that low pressure blood flows from the radial vein to the brachial vein to the subclavian vein, where it dumps into the superior vena cava and settles for a second in the right atria before dropping into the right ventricle. From there, it's sent to the lungs, where it gets oxygenated and then comes back into the left atria before sliding down into the left ventricle, where it builds up pressure again and spurts back out into your aorta. It takes about a minute for all the blood in your body to complete that circuit, which means even if you're mostly at rest, your hard-working circulatory system moves about 7,500 liters of blood through your heart every day. Just in the time that you've been sitting there listening to me, probably about 52 liters has coursed through. So yes, much like the internet, your blood vessels are more than just a series of tubes. During the time that you've been circulating all that blood, you learned about the basic three-layer structure of your blood vessels, how those structures differ slightly in different types of vessels, and you followed the flow of blood from your heart to capillaries and your right thumb and all the way back to your heart again. If you like Crash Course and you want to help us keep making videos like We do, but we gotta go. All right. <laughs> so, uh, those are your blood vessels, right? So, like I said, their job is to actually deliver that oxygen throughout the body, but they're also in charge of like gathering all that CO2 from the body as well, right? So, here's what we need to do we need to remember which blood vessels are arteries and which blood vessels are veins, right? Um, so, arteries are going away from the heart right so we're gonna kind of we're gonna go here uh whoops and we're gonna have a little heart uh and we're gonna have arteries they are going away from the heart right so we're gonna have an oxygenated heart here uh we're gonna fill that with oxygen right uh and then the arteries are going away from it okay so these are your very, very large arteries, right? These are big blood vessels, okay? Um, and they need to be large because like they need to have really thick walls, right? So we're gonna say arteries, I'll put that in bold. Okay, so your arteries are traveling away from the heart. Now they will get a little bit smaller. They'll branch down just a little bit. Uh, and they'll become what we call arterioles, okay? Uh, arterioles are smaller versions of arteries. So arterioles are what your arteries will eventually kind of branch into. Remember yesterday we talked about bronchi and then they branched into bronchioles. Those are the small versions, okay? So arteries are traveling away from the heart. Now veins are traveling towards the heart. Okay, so veins, we're gonna go ahead and put the heart over here this time, All right? Uh, we'll put that right there and we'll go ahead and just draw that. Uh, we'll fill that generally blue, right? So veins, veins are going towards the heart. So they're gonna go, I guess, you know what? Actually, never mind. I'll put this over here. <laughs> um, so veins are going towards the heart. That way the arrows are facing different. That makes more sense. So uh, veins are also relatively large, but they're definitely smaller than arteries, okay? Uh, just a little bit. They're, 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 they can be pretty big. They're the big versions of what they are, but they're not huge, right? So these are your veins, okay? And then you'll have smaller versions of veins uh, that are actually, instead of branching apart, they're kind of branching together. Uh, those are gonna be your venules, okay? So we'll put that out here. I don't think that's going to fit in my thing yet. Um, so venules are going to be right here, okay? So you're going to have big arteries branching into smaller arterioles, and you're going to have small venules coming together to become veins, which will eventually deposit back into the heart. Now, in the middle, you are going to have 
little microscopic webs that we are going to call capillaries, okay? So we're going to kind of draw our own little capillaries here uh, because they're going to kind of look something a little bit like this. They're going to cover, like, let's say you've got some version of a tissue here, right? So here's like some version of uh, uh, a tissue. So we'll go ahead and put that right there. So what you're going to have is you're going to have uh, some of the deoxygenated vessels kind of covering everything. And that's where like, you know, the tissue has metabolized. And so it's got, you know, uh, uh, some deoxygenated stuff here. So it's kind of covered in, you know, sort of the deoxygenated side of things here, right? And it kind of branches around and looks something kind of like that, right? Um, so when your deoxygenated stuff, like this is the tissue has already dropped off all of its oxygen. So what it needs is to pick up lots of oxygen. So it's going to get deli oxygen delivery from these versions of the tissue here, right? So that's kind of what we're going to see in what we call a capillary bed. You're going to have sort of a, we kind of draw it like this. And so capillaries kind of look something kind of like this. We'll say cap it. We'll put the, uh, <laughs> And then we'll have blue here, <laughs> right? So that's kind of what your capillaries are. Are they deoxygenated? Are they oxygenated? Yes. <laughs> you know, like uh, they're really the exchange site of all of these nutrients, right? So looking at this, right? Giving our definitions here. So arteries are the largest blood vessels. They carry blood away from the heart. They branch into smaller versions called arterioles. So what would happen is an artery would get smaller and smaller and smaller until eventually we'd call it an arteriole. And we get smaller and smaller and smaller until eventually it would form part of the capillary bed. And a capillary is a microscopic blood vessel that cover new uh, tissues so that they can ex act as the exchange site, right? So what's kind of cool about capillaries is like they're basically ejecting blood cells out of them, uh, you know, and like, you know, getting nutrients in and then like coming back the other way, right? So like, what's funny about a capillary, this is my favorite, like kind of weird fact about a capillary. Oftentimes, these blood vessels are smaller than a red blood cell. And your red blood cells are some of the smallest cells you have in your entire body. Now, when you say that, you're like, well, that didn't make any sense at all. Like the first time I heard that, I was like, that didn't, how can the thing traveling through the tube be bigger than the tube. Well, that's actually part of the reason why blood cells are sort of shaped like a donut, right? Um, uh, like if you look at a red blood cell, it looks something kind of like this, right? It looks like kind of a, a filled in little donut there. And what that does is it allows, it's very easy to kind of fold and squeeze. And what that does is when it has to like, fold its way through like a very small capillary. It gets stuck and then pops out the other side. And what does that do? That actually increases your blood pressure slightly to make sure that blood can keep flowing, even if it happens to be really far away from the heart. So it can be super far away, but still maintain a little bit of pressure. And then that also actually makes oxygen delivery and extraction a little bit easier. Um, so capillaries are really small microscopic blood vessels. In fact, they're so small, that's why it's so easy to like bump them and then like bruise your, your hand, right? Like you basically broke the walls of the capillaries because they are microscopically thin. So then uh, this capillary will either have, you know, dropped off, uh, uh, you know, oxygen or uh, picked up CO2, or if it was in the lungs, it would do the opposite, it would drop off CO2 and pick up oxygen. Um, so that capillary, is, it, that, that blood cell is done doing that. And so now it needs to get back to the heart so it can get delivered to wherever it is it's going, right? So it'll get sucked in through a venule, which is a small version of a vein. Uh, and then a bunch of venules are all going to kind of come together until they're a large enough tube that we consider it to be a vein at this point. And then the veins are going to carry it back towards the heart. So key message, arteries are always going away from the heart. Veins are always going towards the heart and capillaries are in the middle acting as the exchange sites. And like I said, you have a ton of these blood vessels. Um, when you look at it, it is absolutely covering the various tissues throughout the body. And this is not all of them. Like body's exhibit does like a decently good job of like covering tissues with blood vessels. It's not bad. 
not even close to what it actually looks like. <laughs> like you are way more covered than it looks in these pictures. These are very cool, very artistic um, things. And yeah, it looks something kind of like this, but you would absolutely be covered. Like there's, I see empty space, you know, uh, there is hardly any empty space. So here's the thing about your veins though. Uh, there is kind of a very special thing that veins have. Um, veins do need to have special, if you look at our blood, uh, if you look at your blood vessels here, um, you will notice that they all have like interesting little tunics in them. That's actually what allows them to expand and contract, uh, little sphincters that allow them to control the blood to wherever it happens to be going. But veins in particular also have a little bit of a special piece of anatomy there. Cause you got to remember, you know, this is actually a really, come on. That's a great picture. Yeah, that'll look. Um, you take a look here, you can see uh, uh, your arteries are much thicker walled. They have to be. I mean, like the blood's coming right out of the heart. Pressure's really high at that point. We don't want to break it. Um, but your your veins, their walls are actually relatively thin. And that's because pressure's really low, right? Think about like the journey a blood cell has to go on. Like it leaves your heart, pops up the aorta and then drops down and goes all the way down to like your right pinky toe, which is about as far away as you can get from the heart in the body, right? So then it's gotta get sucked all the way back to the heart. Pressure's going lower and lower and lower the entire time. If you look at like the blood pressure, um, uh, chart of blood vessels. If you look at the pressure of your blood vessels, it looks something kind of like this, right? Like there's a ton of pressure coming right out of the heart. It gets smaller and smaller and smaller until eventually there's hardly any pressure left coming all the way back to your heart. So how do we keep, how do we get blood to come all the way back to the heart? Well, your veins luckily have these little valves in them. You can see this little valve right here. And basically they're really simple. There's just a valve that looks like this. So if you were to pump blood from underneath my hands, it would kind of go like that. And then if the blood pumping stopped for a second, that valve would just kind of simply close back down. So it would get pumped and it would shut back, slam shut again. Uh, really could not be any simpler uh, in terms of anatomy. What that does is if blood gets ejected this way, and then it pauses for a second as the heart's relaxing, right? The blood slams here, doesn't go any further, and then it pumps again, pushing it all this way, and then it slams shut. So it can go up and up and up and up and up until eventually it gets all the way back to our heart. Uh, and your veins are really strategically located throughout the body. If you actually look at your calf muscles, uh, you actually have veins directly situated between the two sides of your gastric nemus muscle, right? Um, I'm actually, these are not actually pictures that I'm looking for. There we go. Uh, so you've got two sides of the gastric nemus. That's your calf muscle, right? Uh, and there's a vein that goes straight up through the center. And so veins are, again, they have a little bit of these valves to make it easier for blood to get all the way back to the heart. And uh, they're situated between muscles. So when your muscles squeeze, it actually pumps the blood in the direction that we want it to go. This, all of my uh, vets who are in the room right now, is exactly the reason they tell you not to lock your knees <laughs> when you are standing at attention. Because if you lock your legs, While you are standing at attention, what happens? You pass out. You're passed out. You pass, pass out. out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Here we go. Right? Whoop, there he goes. <laughs> right? So we do not want to lock. <laughs> the reason that that happens is because you are, all of your blood's down here. When your brain doesn't get enough oxygen, it goes, well, you know what I know? I know that fluids travel this way a lot easier than they travel this way. So your brain goes, you know what? Lay down. <laughs> and it's a defense mechanism. Um, and that's what happens every time. You've also experienced the same thing if you've ever been sitting for a long time and like the doorbell rings and you're like, oh, pizza's here. And you walk, Ugh. right? And you have that moment where you kind of pass out. That is a very sudden and very dramatic drop in your blood pressure because you moved over there, but your blood still wants to be over there. <laughs> Uh, and when your brain doesn't get oxygen, it knows that the safest thing to do is to go horizontal. Uh, so it's a fun little protective mechanism there.
So that is all of the anatomy. Now we're caught back up to where we are uh, uh, of uh, your heart and your blood vessels. Now there is one particular set of arteries that I wanna stop and talk about here real quick. Uh, and those are your coronary arteries. So your coronary arteries are the arteries that are responsible for delivering blood to the heart itself, okay? So your coronary arteries, here's the thing, all arteries are traveling away from the heart, okay? The most important ones are the ones that are coming right off the heart itself. So if you look at your coronary arteries, you will notice they branch right out of the aorta itself. So this little tube right here, that's coming right out of the left ventricle. So when your left ventricle squeezes, it goes up this tube, circles around, drops behind the heart, right? Looks kind of like this, and then drops behind. Um, but there are some little branches that come right off that. You know, when you're on an airplane and they say, secure your mask before trying to help anybody else, the reason they do that is because you are not of use to anyone if you are also unconscious. Your heart knows this. <laughs> so your heart has little branches that come right off. The very first thing that your heart does is give itself oxygenated blood. And that seems a little weird because you're like, wouldn't my heart just be able to like absorb the oxygen passively? Like, you know, there's heart in all these like little chambers right here. Wouldn't my, wouldn't the oxygen just be able to get in? That would be true. Uh, but then you would only be getting oxygen on this side of the heart and this side would be all deoxygenated. So then half of your heart would experience like a heart attack. So instead, these little arteries branch out and they circle around back to the heart and they supply the heart with blood. You've also got coronary veins, uh, which are going to pick it up and, you know, travel it immediately right back on a little short circuit and send it right back into here. So your heart is constantly supplying itself with blood. So when you hear about somebody having a coronary episode or a heart attack, what is happening is these blood vessels here uh, in the heart are actually getting clogged. So when you look at like, we call it coronary artery disease, coronary artery disease is basically where plaque builds up on the inside of our blood vessel walls. Why did that plaque get there? probably likely due to a lifestyle of inactivity uh, and, uh, uh, you know, lots of cholesterol and fats and sugars in our diets. Those are the things that kind of clog up our arteries. Um, so, uh, and then you have like a right side and a left side. That's actually not super important, but it's supplying blood to the right and the left sides of the heart. Um, okay, so now we're, we're caught back up uh, uh, to where we were in my weird PowerPoint order today. Um, so the last thing we have to look at today is the actual like function of everything, right? Uh, and this is actually, I would argue, the easy part because this is stuff that, you know, uh, we actually, you know, get to experience pretty often in the gym. So uh, when we're looking at calculating how your heart is actual actually working, there's going to be two sides to the function of your heart, right? Like if you think about like uh, if you had to math your heart's function, right? You would basically draw the formula to look something kind of like this, right? You would have your heart rate, right? Uh, and that would be the number of, um, the number of beats in 60 seconds, right? So that's your heart rate. And then you would divide it into how much blood is ejected from the heart every time your heart beats, right? That would be called your stroke volume. What was that all about? <laughs> uh, which is the volume of blood ejected from the heart per beat. Okay, so those are our two sort of sides of the formula here, right? Heart rate, the number of beats in 60 seconds, stroke volume, the volume of blood every time your heart beats. So here's the principle that we need to understand. They call this the thick principle. It's uh, a principle used to calculate your overall cardiac output. So this is the quotient of how much blood is basically being delivered every time. So, you know, again, if my heart delivers 10 units of blood every time it beats, and it beats 60 times in a minute, 10 times 60, right? That's gonna be 600 beats or 600 units of blood per minute, 
okay? If my heart was delivering 20 units of blood and it still beats 60 times in a minute, then I would be delivering 1,200 units of blood per minute, right? So that's the overall like quotient. And as your oxygen consumption goes up, then we need to deliver more blood. So what happens? Your heart rate speeds up in order to make up for that. It's like, oh, I don't need 600 units of blood right now. I need 1,200 units of blood. So I can't, if my heart is beating for the same pressure every time, what it would do is it would instead pick up the speed, right? So that's how this sort of works. So when we, we, we're we talking about that, we call that your overall cardiac output, okay? So cardiac output's the most important term. If you actually, if you forget everything I teach you today, this is the main thing I want you to know. So cardiac output, we're going to define that as the overall performance of the heart. Or we would say that is how much blood is pumped out of the heart per minute. Okay. So when we say like how much blood is pumped out of the heart, that was our definition for stroke volume, but it is per minute, which means it's how much blood, actually that's how I want to do this. It's how much blood is pumped per minute. It's my heart rate times my stroke volume. Okay. So that's my formula here, right? Uh, uh, my cardiac output is going to be my heart rate times my stroke volume. So cardiac output equals heart rate times stroke volume. So again, if I am injecting a certain amount of blood out of my heart every single time, my, but my need more blood delivery, then my heart will have to speed up in response. This is one of the reasons we know the lower your resting heart rate is, the better in shape your heart is, right? Um, so cardiac output, and, and by the way, there is a formula that we use to this. this is the, we call this the quotient of blood. So that formula is technically Q equals HR times SV, right? Q stands for quotient, by the way, like that's, that's basically what this, this overall formula is there. Um, so that's probably the most important thing we need to understand. So let's let's look at an example here, right? Let's say uh, uh, let's say Panuka and I are gonna have a race, right? Um, the two of us are gonna have a race and it's a weird race. It's not just who can run the fastest from one place to another. What it's gonna be is we're both gonna get on a treadmill and we're both gonna set that treadmill to four miles per hour not a very fast race. <laughs> uh, and we're both going to go exactly one mile. So we're not really racing to see who can get to the finish line the fastest. But what's going to happen is at the end of that race, what we're actually testing for is who has the lower heart rate. So let's say we both walk a mile. It takes us exactly the same length of time, right? Because we're going four miles per hour. And let's say uh, your heart rate at the end of it is... 120 beats per minute, okay? And at the end of it, my heart rate was 130 beats per minute, okay? So you finished it in 120 beats. I finished it in 130 beats. That means that you were able to do the same amount of work that I was, but you were able to do it in less heartbeats. What does that tell us? It tells us that your heart's in better shape than mine. And that is basically how we understand cardiac output. I want to know my client's stroke volume. I want to know how much blood they can eject out of the heart because that's going to tell me how strong their heart is. But I can't measure that directly. I don't have the sophisticated equipment that it takes. It's, it's possible. There is equipment that can do it, but we don't have access to that in the gym. But we do have access to our client's heart rate. We can put our hand on their wrist or their neck, or we can have them wear a heart rate monitor, right? And we can count the number of beats in 60 seconds. So if we notice that they do a certain amount of work and their heart beats this many times, and then six weeks later, we test them again, they do the same amount of work, but their heart beats less number of times. That tells us that over the last six weeks, their heart increased its overall strength and efficiency. We increased their stroke volume, therefore increasing their total cardiac output, aka they're in better shape now than they were when they met us. And that's the reason we pay attention to this kind of stuff. So 
If the stroke volume is low, the heart rate has to be high. Therefore, the higher your resting heart rate, the less efficient your heart. Average resting heart rate, by the way, is about 70 to 80 beats per minute uh, for most people. That might sound confusing, by the way, for you guys. Uh, I run into this all the time when I'm teaching because uh, uh, I teach personal trainers and everybody's like, that seems kind of high. Yeah, that's probably high sounding, um, 70 to 80, but that is the actual average out there. Uh, in a population of at a school for personal trainers, your resting heart rate's probably a little bit lower um, or on the lower end. That happens all the time. Um, so that is kind of showing us how that works. Now, the other thing we got to look at is actually delivering all of the blood itself. So we need to talk a little bit about like the overall blood pressure. Um, so your pulse pressure, your blood pressure, right, uh, is the difference between how much pressure is in your blood vessels when your heart is contracting, that's systole, and when your heart is relaxing, that's diastole. So the pressure that is like on your heart when your heart squeezes is obviously going to be higher. That's the top number, right? So if we're looking at uh, blood, no, I put it on a different thing. So we're looking at like blood pressure, right? We give that a definition here, blood pressure. This is the overall pressure on the blood vessels of the, of the body during the heart's contraction and or relaxation. So there's gonna be two sides uh, to your blood pressure, right? Um, you are going to have uh, the systole or systolic blood pressure, which is the pressure on the blood vessels uh, during the heart's contraction, which is during, we, act, we actually call that systole. And we have uh, your diastolic blood pressure, which is the pressure on the blood vessel during the heart's relaxation, which is your diastole. Okay, so when we label this, we have, let's say, uh, 120 over 80, right? That's how we're going to typically label this out. So uh, 120 over 80 is referring to the top number. Uh, that is our systolic blood pressure. Uh, and then the bottom number is going to be our diastolic blood pressure. Oh, that's so annoying. <laughs> so uh, there we go. Systo systolic blood pressure over diastolic blood pressure. Typically, that's 120 over 80. Uh, hypertension uh, would be if it gets to 140 over 90. We consider that to be somebody who has chronically high blood pressure. For the record, your blood pressure gets way higher than that all the time. I think the world record um, that we looked up one time was like somebody's blood pressure got to like 500 or something. They were like wearing a blood pressure cuff during like a deadlift. Um, like the highest ever, let's see here, highest ever recorded blood pressure. Uh, and it was like while someone was in the middle of a deadlift. Um, okay, it was 300, right? Um, so that's the thing, right? Like your blood pressure can actually go super high when it needs to because you're doing sports or something, right? We actually love that. That's great. That allows us to deliver blood where we need to get need to get it to go. Um, what we're worried about is like when I say it's 140 over 90 is high blood pressure, I mean like you're sitting there, you've been sitting there for five minutes, relaxed, and your blood pressure is not coming any lower than that. That tells us that we have chronically high blood pressure. And the reason this is bad for us is number one, it's going to be difficult to move blood from one place to another. So you're much more likely to pass out uh, uh, from blood pressure issues. But also 
you got to remember, like blood's also going through your kidneys to filter things in your liver and all that. Uh, and so it's almost like rather than just like <laughs> it'd be like going to a water fountain to get like a drink of water. And then it's just coming out with like a lot of pressure and you like go to get a drink and it's like splashing all over your face. Like, ah, you know, like that's kind of what your kidneys are feeling all day. And that's why like high blood pressure is associated with kidney disease uh, and why we worry about those two things. So uh, there's also another law. We've got the thick principle, which states like the higher your heart rate, the less efficient the heart. Uh, there's also what's called the Frank Starling law, uh, which states that the stroke volume of the heart will increase in response uh, to uh, an increase in your blood volume of your heart. So basically, your heart will do what's called preload, where it'll sort of like expand and take in extra blood when you start working really, really hard. And that's why like you can kind of feel that as you start to get like kind of an adrenaline rush and it feels almost like you can feel your heart pounding in your chest while you're playing sports or things like that. It's because your heart is actually like expanding a little bit harder than it normally does. This is one of the things that actually in the end strengthens your heart because like you are now like exercising and so you are continually pumping lots and lots of blood in there increasing the overall load and therefore you know you're doing reps right uh, and you're making your your heart lift a little bit harder or at least squeeze a little bit harder so uh cardiovascular training effects right summarizing everything up today and and we'll, let's go ahead and look at this from the aspect of like actually increasing our athleticism right um so I'll wrap things up by actually looking at how we can affect the heart in the gym so when you're training your heart we know that cardiovascular exercise, and by the way, cardio can be lifting weights. You don't have to be going for a run or getting on a treadmill or anything like that. Uh, there's lots of forms of cardio. It's anything where your heart rate's just getting elevated for an extended period of time, it increases the efficiency of your heart because it does a couple of really cool different things. Number one, we'll actually see that like trained individuals will actually train their nervous system and their brain will learn how to kind of control that heart rate a little bit more effectively. The SA node will say, okay, you know, we're used to this exercising thing. We don't have to race the heart rate. You know, like guys, your newer clients, they'll have a really hard time with cardio in the very beginning. Um, a lot of people don't know how to control their heart rate. How many people do you guys know say they can't run a mile? Like, oh, I've never even been able to run a mile. Probably somebody, right? Uh, a lot of times that's because people will experience, like they'll get going at a pace and they're like, I think I can keep this up. And then their heart rate will start racing. And they're like, oh God, and they feel really bad and they have to kind of slow down. Or their heart doesn't pick up enough pace. So they get a big lactic acid buildup really quickly and they can't keep up with that. And they're just all over the place, right? It's just like, if you asked me, like I have, I'm, I'm not very good at like darts. I don't, I've never really played darts in my life. You know, a couple of times in a bar, few times in my entire life. I'm not good at it because I don't know how to control my arm just the way that you're supposed to, right? But if I practice consistently, eventually I'm going to get more accurate. Or if I don't get more accurate, at least I will get more consistent. I may be missing in the same way every time, but at least most of them are all kind of going to the same area, right? Same thing is true with your heart rate. The more you start to train your clients, the more they practice doing their cardio, they'll get better at it naturally because they'll learn how to control their heart rate. And then they got to start worrying more about like building their endurance later. And that's a totally different conversation, right? That comes from like an overall physiologic change. But in the very beginning, cardio is probably the thing that people hate the most because it will make you feel really uncomfortable really quickly right out the gate. But... Let's talk about some of the benefits, right? Well, uh, uh, when you look at like distributing your cardiac output at all, like number one, like your body will actually increase uh, uh, your cardiac output, right? Your body, the greater level of activity that you have and the more physically active you are, the more likely your heart is to know how to beat consistently. And it can get the same amount of work done in less beat so it becomes much more efficient similar to like if you are running right you go for a jog and you're like you know at first you're trying to figure out this running thing you don't probably have very good form you don't really know what you're doing and then you increase that form slowly you're like well now i feel really confident doing all these things right this is one of the reasons uh my students who were with me last module uh all of my uh my uh long-standing students in here, we practiced a bunch of different running technique drills 
we didn't even necessarily do a ton of running, right? We practice a lot of drills related to running, and those are all going to have really terrific carryover once we get into the actual sprinting exercises and stuff. Uh, we will also see that like when we start exercising, we are going to increase uh, the production of type one muscle fiber. So there's a principle in physiology which states that you get what you train for, right? So the more often you are exposed to cardiovascular exercise, the more likely your body is to go, man, I am not good at that. I need more of this and I need more of that and then I'll be good at it. You know, like uh, that's your body's like principle of things, right? Like we call that the principle of specificity. Your body goes, whoo, I am, the squats are hard. We need more glute muscle, you know? Oh my gosh, cardio is tough. We need to strengthen the heart. And so what it'll do is it will develop more type one muscle fibers in response. Now type one muscle fibers, what those are is they're muscle fibers that contain a lot of things that make them very good at producing long sustained bouts of energy. So lots of mitochondria, that's where we produce our massive amount of energy over time and lots of oxidative enzymes to improve the usage of that mitochondria. So type one muscle fibers are very, very reliant on your mitochondria. If you were to look at the difference between like one muscle fiber and another, right? Uh, you would have like a type two muscle fiber and a type one, right? Right, so you would probably have more proteins in the type two. It would actually be uh, a, a really strong, heavy lifting fiber. It would look something, you know, probably kind of like this. You can see I've got a lot of muscle fibers in here and I'm gonna have a few little mitochondria right? Little mitochondria, they look something kind of like this every time. And there we go. Now, type two muscle fibers are great because they're really strong. They're really explosive. We love them. But a type one muscle fiber, while it may not have very many muscle fibers in it, like actual contractile proteins, you can see we've only got four compared to the nine that I got over here. It is going to be packed full of these little mitochondria, which means even though there's less fibers, I am able to produce energy like crazy. And this is the difference between like a runner's body and like a bodybuilder, you know, like very, very different body types because they have very different fibers, right? They're gonna have more mitochondria. There's probably gonna be more oxidative enzymes there, right? There's probably gonna be more myoglobin uh, in the type one fiber so that they can deliver oxygen more effectively. Their body in general will probably have more hemoglobin in it uh, just running throughout everything, which is good for us everywhere, not just our running muscles. And so through extended durations of oxidative exercise, the body will create more oxidative enzymes. For the record, guys, this is why it feels like hell every time you take a break from the gym. Your oxidative enzymes, they only last about a week. They really don't live that long. They're temporary little proteins, right? You're supposed to continually keep making them. It's one of the reasons why you take one or two weeks off from the gym, and then you go back for that first session, and you're like, oh, it's here. I lost so much progress in two weeks. No, you didn't. <laughs> All of your working parts are still there. Two weeks off from the gym is not going to kill you. But it will feel terrible when you get back because those enzymes kind of died off and you need to make new ones. Um, particularly with cardio. Like strength training does obviously feel rough too. But like cardio is that thing that you always come back and you're like, this is rough, you know? Um, that's why. It's, it's because we lost some of those enzymes. Um, they don't last long. <laughs> so, um, all right, last thing we got to look at, uh, so we definitely want to have, you know, we are definitely going to create more of those type one fibers. This is what's going to, to really give us that endurance, you know? Um, but last thing we got to look at, let's tie yesterday's lesson together with today's, right? Let's look at oxygen extraction and oxygen delivery together. So uh, one of the things we got to look at is what is called your VO2 max. That's your volume of oxygen consumed at maximum or the maximum amount of oxygen that you are capable of consuming. Now, remember, when I say consuming, I mean using. Yesterday, what was our main lesson yesterday? There is a difference between ventilation and 
respiration. Ventilation is just bringing a bunch of air into your lungs. You could have a huge person, a very large body who can bring lots of air into their lungs, but if they don't have red blood cells that have lots of hemoglobin, if they don't have muscle cells that are gonna eat up that oxygen, then the oxygen comes in, sits there, and a bunch of it gets exhaled. They don't end up using it. So oxygen consumption is the conversion of oxygen to CO2. The more oxygen you can consume, the better shape you're in. The more muscle you have, you're consuming it. The more enzymes you have, you're consuming it, right? You're using it more. So <clears throat> this is where we are going to look at what's called your respiratory exchange ratio. This is sometimes uh, called your respiratory quotient, um, but it looks kind of like this. Uh, it looks something kind of like this. And this is in general for all of us. These numbers uh, are true. So there is a respiratory exchange ratio of 100% uh, to about 70%. So what I mean by that is like, if I brought in 100 units of oxygen and I converted all 100 units of oxygen to CO2, then that's a 100% oxygen consumption. I used all of them. If I brought in 100 units of oxygen and I consumed 70 units, but the remaining 30 didn't get used, that's a 70% consumption rate, okay? So I am either at an RER, a respiratory exchange ratio, of 1.0, which is 100%, or 0.7, which is 70%. Now, there is a time of day where you guys are always at 70% consumption, and there is a time of day where you are at 100% consumption. And you might be thinking, uh, like, where they are. What, does anybody, anybody, uh, anybody have a guess at what, and I, not necessarily this isn't something that happens every day, but what I mean is, like, there is a situation where you will always be at 70%, and there's a situation where you'll be at 100%. Anybody know what they are? Based on what I just said? Using all the oxygen, using very little. Sleep. Sleeping. You nailed it. Yeah. So you are in an RQ or an RER of 70% when you are completely at rest. So when you're sleeping, all the oxygen you bring in, only about 70% of it actually gets used. The remaining 30 just kind of stays in the chamber and it gets exhaled. And then when you are sprinting and fully out of breath and it feels like you're like, I'm going to die, right? Like hard cardio that's when you're at 100% oxygen consumption. Now, here's what's really cool, and this is what's going to kind of pivot us into nutrition. Here's another preview into our nutrition class. Well, that's not true. Here's a preview into our weight loss class. Now, when you are consuming 100% oxygen, you are working really freaking hard. So our favorite source for energy when we're working really hard is carbohydrates. Now, when we're not working very hard, our favorite source of energy we can just, we can wait all day to produce energy. We don't need it to produce quickly. We just need to produce it. So we can wait, which means we can actually rely on our aerobic metabolism and we consume 100% of our energy from fat sources. So you are always at a blend between carbohydrates and fat. So the true fat burning zone is actually when you're asleep, weirdly enough. Uh, and the true carb burning zone is actually when you're sprinting. Now, that might make you think that the best way to lose weight is to sleep all day. But remember, this is also tied to the number of calories burned. You don't burn very many calories sleeping because you're not using much. So what we want to do is we actually want to work really, really hard and burn lots of calories. And even though those calories are mostly coming from carbohydrates, we will have to recover in that fat burning zone. And this is one of the reasons why interval training is so popular, because you work hard and recover low. And so you actually get a big calorie burn from working hard. And even though those calories are coming from carbohydrates, it's still like you're paying for it now. And when you eat later, it's just going to restore your glycogen. So it's still calories burned. But then you are, your, your calorie burn in general, your metabolism is running faster while you are down here in terms of intensity. So you actually end up burning more fat. And that's actually why interval training is so popular for fat loss. So the respiratory exchange ratio is the ratio of oxygen consumed versus the amount of oxygen present in the body.
there's always some version of a ratio. You guys are probably around like 0.72 right now if you're sitting down, you know? Uh, if you were fully at rest, you'd be at like 0.7. So if the oxygen comes into the body and 70% of it is consumed, that gives us a ratio of 0.7. And the more you develop your VO2 max in general, the more you can learn how to consume more oxygen as a general rule, the more stuff you have to eat oxygen, right? The more muscle you have, the more enzymes you have, the more hemoglobin you've got, the more myoglobin you've got, the more, like I said, muscle, right? The more stuff there is, the more oxygen you are going to consume, the more stuff you're going to eat. It takes more to fuel a complicated athletic body than it does an unathletic one. So you end up consuming more oxygen, the same way that you would consume more calories, you know? And that's really where we can actually measure athleticism. So the VO2 max is one of our best gauges for how athletic an individual happens to be. So we have a lot of VO2 tests out there. There's the really good VO2 test that you can do, uh, which is like, you know, actually getting on like a machine and it's measuring how much oxygen, how many they can actually measure how much oxygen is going in versus how much CO2 is going out. The more you consume, the more athletic you are. Um, but we also have like the Rockport walk test. We can do a test by simply making a client walk and it can measure their VO2 max. Or if you've ever done the pacer test, the beep test where you run back and forth, that can actually put you into a VO2 category. So the more you can consume, the better shape you're in. That's what we want to go for, right? So we want to develop a body with lots of enzymes, lots of muscle mass, lots of hemoglobin, lots of myoglobin, lots of things that eat oxygen. Because the more they eat, the more energy they output, right? Just like looking at a car's engine. The stronger a car's engine is, it's not going to get very good mileage. <laughs> you know, like unfortunately, you know, the more powerful your car or your truck is, the less mileage it's going to get uh, in terms of miles per gallon. But the amount of energy it is able to output will be way higher than, you know, like um, a VW bug. You know what I mean? <laughs> so that's kind of what we are trying to develop. We are trying to develop an athletic body that can consume lots and lots of oxygen. The more we know that we can consume, the better shape we are in to power our bodies, and the more out energy output we have. Um, so there's the preload thing is the volume of blood that stretches out your heart in order to eject it. That's one of the reasons why your heart, you know, kind of feels like a little like poundy the first time you, as, as you begin exercising. Uh, and then the last of this PowerPoint is going to kind of wrap up with some equations here that I don't really need you guys to know. Um, uh, you know, but, oh, sorry, actually one last sentence, uh, before getting into the formulas, <laughs> um, the efficiency of the heart. So. Summarizing everything up, an individual with a resting heart rate that's 10 beats lower uh, than it was when they initially began training is somebody who has increased their heart's efficiency. They are probably consuming more oxygen than they used to, and therefore they're outputting more power. And since they're outputting more power, their heart doesn't have to beat as often. And that's how that's all kind of tied together. Uh, and then, like I said, the rest of this, you're going to see like these little formulas here. Um, I don't know why these are in here, honestly. Um, but basically they'll look at also like understanding like what limits your VO2 max. Sometimes it can be like uh, the pressure in the atmosphere. Sometimes it can be like the enzymes you have, like your hemo concentration. Like you just don't have very much, like you'd be dehydrated. So your blood plasma is like really low. Uh, but here are kind of these general numbers that you'll see that kind of represent that. And I don't know why that's in there. I <laughs> uh, I asked NASA if I could delete it and they never got back to me. But <laughs> um, but that is basically everything uh, in concern to your heart, guys. Uh, a little bit of a longer lesson today. I appreciate you guys sticking with me. Um, I know that was we're we're a little bit over on our average time here. But uh, any questions or comments on cardiovascular stuff? Did that all make sense as to how VO two max works and cardiac output and things like that. I see a thumbs up and a heart. Yes, sir. <laughs> all good. Feeling good. All right. Oh, I didn't know. I can actually see the thumbs up in the chat bubble over here too. Huh. Okay. Um, cool. All right. Well, let me kill the recording here.